Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States of America and the youngest one to ever serve. He was inaugurated in the year of 1961, beating out the incumbent Republican representative, Richard Nixon. Many thought that he would win. However, John shocked the country. In the popular vote, his margin of victory was among the closest ever in American history. John F. Kennedy was only 43 years old when he, was, when he started in the office, and he was not only the youngest president ever, but also the first Roman Catholic to ever serve for our country. Due to JFK being Roman Catholic, this led to my mom, Peg Kennedy, and her family to like him and believe in his ability to lead the country. As a young kid, my mom was very religious and faithful to her religion that her family abided by. She prayed daily and went to church weekly, keeping in touch with God, just like the famous Kennedys. Oh, my family really liked him because he was Roman Catholic, like mine. Um, and growing up as a kid, we went to church a lot, so that really stood out for my parents. And yes, my parents did vote for him. In his reign of his short presidency, he faced many difficult things. He first started out with the country in a slight recession, and he also dealt with the worst years of the Cold War. However, his economic programs launched the country onto its longest expansion since World War II. America's economy was shrinking, and unemployment rates across the nation had grown. But Kennedy improved the country by investing billions of dollars into the economy right away. In this way, JFK put forth money towards state highway aid funds, accelerated payment of tax refunds and life insurance dividends, created a food stamp program, and expanded employment offices. Not only did he gain his trust in America for helping the country, but he also saved it from getting blown to pieces by the Soviet Union. In 13 days, the world almost ended, from October 16th until October 28th in 1962, known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. With Kennedy being so young and new as the president, the Soviets figured they could test his leadership and thought that he would back down in any crisis facing off against them. As they tested his power, he proved them wrong and showed that he can be one of the strongest and greatest leaders of American history. He didn't back down at all if it's one of the most powerful countries at the time. It made them look weak by being forced to back down against John's great leadership. Not only was he a powerful man, though, he was also a handsome, clean-cut man. And the result of him being so young and his good looks, it made the youth love him even more. In the 1960s, it was an accomplishment to many, a virtue for them to be young. The young embraced their youth youthfulness and was a reason why many, including my mom's family, like John F. Kennedy and his mystique family. Jackie Kennedy, John's wife, was also a very pretty woman in her time. The two were a power couple together, bringing extra attention towards them. As John and his family lived through their normal lives, it suddenly turned dark. It turned dark super fast. It changed the lives of many that day and the course of American society. On November 22, 1963, John was sitting in his motorcade with driver and secret server, serviceman William Robert Greer, Jackie to his left, and two others in the convertible, going through downtown Dallas, Texas, in Dealey Plaza, campaigning for the next election in 1964. He was only trying to gain more followers from the, from the South, yet at the end of the day, his life was over. As he was driving with the crowd surrounding him, two bullets pierced through his body, one in the head and the other in his back. As he was hit, he grabbed the area of his neck and started to almost look downwards. Then another bullet flew in at him and drilled him right in the head. The second bullet that hit him on the right side of the head made part of it explode, ending up with himself laying lifelessly, yet still alive. Sitting in front of him was a politician named James Conway, and as he turned to look back at the president, one of the bullets struck him as well. Before losing consciousness, Connolly recalled seeing a chunk of Kennedy's brain fall onto him. The limo soon sped towards Parkland Memorial Hospital, a few miles away where JFK was soon pronounced dead. Meanwhile, Connolly underwent surgery for wounds to his back, chest, wrist, and thigh, and ended up making a full recovery. Um, on that day, it was actually a school day, like any other. Uh, when we heard the news, the teachers actually sent us home. We were pretty scared because we didn't know what was going on. It was pretty much pandemonium everywhere. Still to this day, many people don't understand the tragedy of that day. Was there more than one shooter? How did the bullets end up where they did with the trajectory of them? And so many more questions flood people's heads. Uh, when we first heard the news, everybody was scared. We were actually scared for our lives because we didn't know what happened. 
we thought that someone or someone, something or someone could have actually attacked, were attacking us, and we were thinking that maybe another war was coming. We were scared to death. Did you have any guess to who possibly could have shot him, like a communist or anything like that? No, we were, we had no idea, and that was the scary part. Even one man is still a mystery. Lee Harvey Oswald, the so-called murderer of the 35th president of the United States of America. Lee Harvey Oswald was a nobody. Many people think that he did the kill to become famous, and it sure worked out if that was his goal. In his life, he served in the American military. However, he believed that he was a communist and defected to the Soviet Union in 1959. In 63, he eventually came back to America with his wife and settled in Dallas. When he came back, he was a notorious community agitator. He wanted the U.S. to stay out of Cuba and disagreed with the thoughts of everyone. The day that he, he killed JFK, presumably 45 minutes after the catastrophe, he also killed a police officer named J.D. Tippett. 30 minutes later, Oswald was soon found in a movie theater, not too long after, where he was arrested and charged for the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. November 22, 1963, marks a scar in America, still to this day. In addition, the day after, where Lee was killed by Jack Ruby in a police station basement. We may never know the real truth of if he was the murderer, but the evidence stacks upon him. This day still scars my memory. For example, thing that scared us the most was the uncertainty of what had happened um, and the possibility of my life, my friends, and my family, and what was going to happen to us next. We thought it could be anybody next. Remember, there was no social media or anything, so there weren't, there weren't many details on who was the source of this and what would the state of our nation was. We may possibly never know if Lee Harvey Oswald was the true killer of JFK, but what we do know is that our country has not been the same since, and it won't ever again.